I once heard Christopher Nolan say that the trick to creating a good, high quality, but low budget film is to avoid doing anything that would actually hint to the audience that you are actually on a low budget. He gave the example of using a gun on a low budget film set if you don't have the budget to have a real gun on set because it's dangerous and expensive to deal with that, you might give your actor a fake gun, a toy gun, a rubber gun. The problem with this is that the actor is playing with something they know isn't real. They're not going to have the weight and it's just going to feel fake. It's going to feel low budget. The solution he gave to this was simply to use a hammer instead of a gun as the weapon in his film. This meant that it was easier and cheaper to have the actor actually using a proper implement. It had the weight, the heft, and the reality, and that would lead overall to a higher quality feeling film in the end. This is such a simple concept, but when I heard him say this, it really struck a chord with me. It really resonated with me and clarified a lot of basic ideas that I think are important for all types of art. Now, I'm coming from a completely different genre and medium than him. I create comic books, I create illustrations, but I think this idea of using creativity and being very careful about how you choose what to present to the audience is actually vital for all artists and I think we can all learn a lot from this very, very simple idea. Now, you might be thinking, look, what does this got to do with me? I'm not a director. How does this relate to what we normally talk about on this show, which is drawing, improving our craft, thinking about creativity and productivity? I really think that this simple idea is fundamental, especially if you're tackling projects, but also if you're just doing single illustrations, but especially if you're trying to think about yourself as a solo creator, someone who is creating a larger work. Anyway, this should be a fun discussion, so I hope you'll join me. Let's jump in and get started. Welcome to the Visual Scholar Podcast. My name's Tim McBurney. I have been a professional working artist for over 20 years. And on this show, we're all about demystifying the worlds of art, creativity, and productivity so that you can get better faster and enjoy your artistic journey. Now, Christopher Nolan was giving this advice when he was talking about the first feature film that he created, which was called Following. This was a black and white, really low budget film that was created at a time where creating a low budget film like this was very challenging. It was before we had a lot of easy access to digital cameras and it really was quite a feat what he was managing to do. And I do want to dive in and talk about that in a little bit more detail because I think there's other great advice that he gave in that specific little interview. And I'll link that interview um, down below so you can go check it out. I think there is a version of it on YouTube. But before we get there, it's worth just unpacking this concept a little bit and, and sort of talking about how I think it's going to relate to, you know, all art. When I was starting out as an artist, what I remember is often... Some of the most frustrating times were when I'd sort of gotten to a point where like, look, my art wasn't super amateurish. It was obvious at that time that I was serious, right? I was better than your average sort of person off the street who, you know, had never drawn before. And it was obvious to people that I was trying, but I would really find that the most frustrating thing was the inconsistency of the products that I was creating. I would sometimes be able to create an image and it would work, look pretty well. You know, I'd be able to get something and people would see it and, and people would have a good response to it. And I feel like half the time that would happen and half the time I'd go to create something and it would just be a total nothing, right? Like it would be so badly drawn or so badly rendered that it would just be impossible to even tell what it was, right? There's so many examples of this. And I think a lot of it comes specifically from the way that we learn. We often learn little bits here and there. We build craft and technique around areas that we are, you know, sort of interested in and already good at. So for instance, you know, I, I would get good at being able to draw a face from a few different angles, but when I try and do other things that maybe I had an idea for, like, you know, creating an open mouth, right? Mouth open, it would just be a complete unmitigated disaster. It would look like this really weird, um, crazy version with this sort of dislocated jaw and the teeth would be all over the place. And, 
you know, it, it would sort of go from like, oh, here I'm an artist and I think I know what I'm doing to kind of like, oh, no, like this is not even worth showing anyone. In one image, I'm, I'm sort of going way outside my comfort zone and I'm not quite sure why. In another image, maybe I'm more inside my comfort zone. And I think so much of, you know, really figuring out how to create work and put your best foot forward when you need to as an artist is about understanding the subtleties here. And again, as I said, I think it relates not just to the amateur artist, but also to the professional who is, you know, a complete veteran. I think that people naturally figure out how to deal with these scenarios and show you what they're good at. Obviously, what they're good at expands, so they have more range. But still, I think this concept is really key. And it's one of these things that, again, I feel like a lot of people mess up and it causes a lot of frustration, just as it did for me when I was trying to figure these things out in the beginning. So it's important to understand here that again, I'm framing this like as a metaphor, right? Think about the way that you create, especially projects. If you're creating an art book or a gallery show, you're trying to collect a series of images, you're trying to create a sketchbook, you're trying to create a comic book, maybe a series of designs. I think this fundamental idea of thinking as you present the work and you create a, a project, a collection of your images that are sort of curated and presented in a particular way, let's say, you really think about that a little bit more like a director and try and be creative with understanding how to select from the things that you have, the skills, the talent, the craft, the images that worked, the images that didn't, and understand that that's often what is, you know, part of making good work anyway. And it doesn't really matter how much budget you have, you still need to take that into consideration. So again, that's a metaphor, but I think it is really a fundamental way that we can understand how I think good work is created by artists who are making good decisions. A key thing here is about our ego as an artist, as it relates to technique and craft and skill, like raw ability versus the more creative way that we might present our work or create work, which is a little bit more sneaky. It's a little bit more about smoke and mirrors. It's a little bit more like, again, a director would think where they have a limited budget, a lim limited number of things that they can present. And their job is to be creative, to think about what's the sneakiest way that I can, you know, make people feel a particular thing. And I think in the beginning as artists, often what we're sort of told to do or like our natural instinct perhaps is to build skill, raw ability. And we often think that the key and the solution to creating great art is just to increase the budget, right? To increase the raw skill, your just raw throughput and your ability to do everything really, really well. And if we just increase that, that our art is going to become amazing. There's truth to that for sure, but it's this other element of creating art that I think is really important, right? Where we think about how to creatively pick from the things that already exist, that are already good, and we can choose what is going to be good and bad for the particular scenario that we're trying to create. And again, we think more creatively in that instance, and we let what is available to us influence the work that we actually create. Ultimately, I think that you will find if you look around, great art is created by people who master these two things, the craft and the skill, the budget, the raw power, the raw ability to have choice, to do anything you want with your art but then also the ability to be selective with that and pick from that the very best, right? The cream of the crop of your abilities and skills and techniques, the things that people really respond to you the most when they see your work. This really means that if you master both of these, if you get good at having raw talent, raw skill, and then you get good at applying it and figuring out how to take the best of it, that your work will be greater than the sum of its parts, that all of these things will combine to actually mean that the gestalt, the final product that you create, is actually better than all of the little separate bits and pieces, all of the technique, all of the skills. We're trying to create something that has a little bit of magic to it. Now, if we take a look at that advice, I think it's it's really good advice, and I recommend um, you know watching the video and listening to Christopher Nolan because I think 
just hearing him speak about it and how he kind of thinks about creating things is a really good insight into a great creative mind. I think he's one of the artists who has managed to create great low budget films and have a fairly consistent level of quality throughout his career. And again, you know, I think his ability to be creative and really think and also communicate that is second to none, right? It's uh, always really interesting to listen to him talk about his craft. But in the video where he's talking about his first low budget film following, he talks about Again, this idea of the gun. Again, it's a pretty simple idea, but I think there's a lot we can learn from it. It's the reason I often bring it up. If you look at someone who is just holding a rubber gun or a toy gun, it obviously doesn't have the same weight. So physically, the way that it moves around is going to feel just subconsciously to the viewer a little bit funny, a little bit fake, like someone playing with a toy. There's also probably just the attitude that maybe you have to have someone teach the actor how to use the gun because, you know, if you have someone just sort of floating the gun around or not using it properly, it's going to feel fake. And if you look at a lot of, you know, films that have been able to create good authenticity around things like sword play or gun play, there often is a lot of training involved with the actors to make sure that they're doing these things and looking like they know what they're doing. And you just don't have the budget to do that in a low budget film. So unless that's a specialty, unless that's part of the skills you do have, the easiest solution is just not to use a gun. And to me, it's like so simple, but it's the difference between wanting to make something happen because again, it's like, oh, I need this thing to look like a professional, right? But I don't have the budget versus just saying, well, let's just do something different, right? Let's just use a hammer, right? It's the same thing. It might even be better. And then you can think about how to make the hammer as a weapon into more of a dramatic part of the story and the actors can have a hammer. Um, you know, there's, you know, no particular way you would use a hammer as a weapon that's going to, you know, um, tell the audience that this is a low budget film. So it's just a matter of thinking about making good decisions and, and not doing anything that's going to signal to you, to your audience that they're watching something which is low budget or amateur. Other things that are obviously going to help this are making the entire film black and white, controlling the color, making sure that the lighting is consistent from shot to shot, making it all kind of look good is pretty challenging from like a cinematography perspective. If you make it all black and white, it reduces that complexity and it's more likely that shots are gonna seem similar to each other. Um, and you don't have to necessarily do a lot of the, you know, color design and all that stuff. So again, reducing complexity in general, so you have left, less problems that are going to come up means you can focus on, again, putting your budget where you need it. And that idea of making things black and white is obviously something you could employ with uh, comics or art in general. Think about limiting your palette, limiting the style, making things a lot simpler to reproduce to get, you know, get consistent, I think is something that's always worth thinking about. Another thing that you can see at play in that film is the idea of limiting the lighting. Now, if you look at big budget Hollywood films, or maybe if you're not aware of that, there's often lighting when it comes to, you know, particular filmic situations, right? There's lights around me. I have them set up in a particular way. And on a big budget Hollywood film, in order to make things look realistic, um, give richness, separate characters from background, you need to put a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of really talented people to make that cinematography work properly, make the lighting actually function. And there's a whole bunch of people where that's their whole job. If you're on a low budget, you don't necessarily have that. So often if you watch the film and you know see some of the shots there, you can see that there's a lot of use of natural light in most instances and just simple sort of graphic blocking, right? So we're always framing things using natural light with a window. This is actually something that's recommended for a lot of YouTubers. If you don't know what you're doing with lighting, just sit next to a window and it'll give you a pretty good result. So those are just a few key ideas that I think uh, are worth sort of mentioning. But, uh, you know, I, I reckon you just go watch the video if you've got time to kind of, um, you know, look at it. I'll link to it in the show notes or the YouTube description and just kind of see what he has to say. I think it is very much an attitude that is important. And I think it's interesting because I really do think that it's this 
sort of discipline that he took into his much larger films that allowed them to look as good as they do. And it's that creative thinking that I think has allowed him to get a lot of these practical effects and really, you know, sort of groundbreaking visuals onto film. I think he is very sort of advanced in the way he does that. And you can see that is that creative mind of the sort of director of the filmmaker where you really have to think about the smoke and mirrors of it. What does the viewer see? What's important? How do I modify that? And how do I sort of manipulate what they think they're seeing so that they are following along with the key focus, the key story that I actually want to tell? Okay, look, how, how does this apply to us as artists, right? So we're, we're obviously not film directors and we have a slightly different set of challenges. But I think one of the primary challenges that artists have is that we kind of mush all of these ideas into one. We can potentially have a higher budget for ourselves. And I think using a budget is a great metaphor. We can have a higher budget for our project, our film, our comic, if we just get better at drawing. It's often said with comics, for instance, and I'll use comics as an example here because it will just stop me bouncing around. But just keep in mind that I think these things apply to all facets of art and all different mediums. I think it's a fundamental concept. But for comic books, it's often said, and writers often say, oh, it's much better writing for comic books because as long as you can type it, then the poor artist is going to draw it. And writers will often are often famous for, again, writing out these crazy scenes. It's like, oh, we've got a giant crowd here and you've got like a million superheroes fighting each other. And this person picks up a car and smashes it over here. And it's all fine because, you know, in comics, you've got an unlimited budget. But I think what you actually find is that's not really true because an artist actually needs to be good at drawing all those things. And for comic book writer artist teams, one of the things you find is that good writers will actually write to an artist's strength. They'll understand what a writer is good at and what they are not good at. And they'll make sure they're not going to give them any cues or scenes or panels to draw that are not really going to be A, what they want to do, B, what they're excited about, and C, that you know is sort of outside their general areas of expertise. As artists, though, we are a little bit different here because... I think that we have to take into consideration one special thing. And there's three concepts here that I think are sort of interconnected that we can really figure out how to apply this concept to ourselves as artists. But one of them is challenge. And with challenge, what we're really dealing with is how do I feel as I'm working on the image? And I think a lot of that has to do with the degree to which you're pushing yourself, where you're pushing those abilities. And I think one of the frustrating things that can happen, and I think what was often happening to me in the beginning, as I was saying earlier, that I would create an image and one of them would be good and the other would be a complete disaster, is that that one that's a complete disaster was just a little bit outside my level of ability. And I think that it's so important as artists to make sure that we are just making that level of challenge a little bit. It, it needs to, we need to be pushing ourselves a little bit, I think, to engage that kind of sense of adventure, of flow, of creativity. It's said that flow exists, you know, with a little bit of fear, right? With a little bit of excitement. We do need some degree to where we're pushing ourselves, we're trying something new as artists, but we also need to make sure that that sort of, you know, range is pretty small. We need to be working for the majority inside our existing comfort zone and pushing the challenge just a little bit. And I actually think that this idea of considering the, like the scope and the focus, which are the other two sort of elements here, scope, focus, and challenge, if we really consider scope and focus, I think that that will allow us to hopefully think like a director and make sure that we are thus managing the challenge. And I think if we manage the challenge, there is a degree to where the final result and our actual feeling of creating this work will kind of hopefully sync up at some point. We'll get to a good degree where we're picking things, we're managing our scope, and we're making sure that the final product that we make is something we're going to enjoy working on. It's a good level of challenge. And also, we're picking from our abilities so that the final image is actually going to be something that has a good chance of being 
awesome. So if we think about those three things, I think this is a good way to frame it. The first is scope, the second is focus, the third is challenge. We talked a little bit about challenge. The idea of scope is very similar to what we've been discussing. Think like a director. There's probably a million different things that you could draw. There's a million ways you could draw it. And the key is to understand that as an artist, you're in control of these concepts. Maybe not as an artist who you know is being given a brief by someone else, but especially if you're a solo creator, you have full control of that. But even if you are working for someone else, part of the way that you're going to find success is to think about making sure that you know you kind of reframe that brief in a way that you are going to be able to create a good image. And I think many of the mistakes I've made in my career are where I kind of you know don't get that right. I, I just sort of try and create something and it's just well outside my comfort zone. And it doesn't really matter what happens. Even if I can kind of get it across the line, that thing is never going to look optimum and it's never really going to be me doing the best thing that I can do. And often clients and people we work with are after us doing the best thing that we can do in the first place. And insofar as they're telling us to do something that maybe we're not comfortable with, you know, they're probably not really even thinking about that. That is our job always as artists to create good work, to try and put our best foot forward and to figure out a way to kind of make all of these these things work together. What someone else is wanting of our work, how we interpret that, how we create that. It's our job to communicate these ideas and present solutions. And a big part of that is about being creative. It's about managing the scope and understanding what your abilities are and how to handle the smoke and mirrors of it all to make sure that you're picking the best solutions for the job. If we think about focus and how focus plays into this, focus is how I would define the final goal. So if we think about Christopher Nolan's example of saying, obviously a focus there is they're in a city. This is a living, breathing world. That's the focus. The scope and the challenge and the creativity are how we decide how we tell that story, that key point of focus. And I think often what we need to learn as artists as we progress is that there are probably many ways to get your key idea across. And I think this is very much the case for someone who might be creating a comic book or an illustration. What we need to think about is what is our story about? What is the fundamental key idea here? What's this scene about? What's really important? What are the feelings that I want the audience to feel? You obviously have these emotions. Oh, this is going to be a cool story. It's going to be set here. I'm going to have, you know, these um, fantasy knights and they're sort of fighting and behind them is this epic sort of castle. And then I get all this other stuff happening and it's this living, breathing world, right? We're kind of imagining these living worlds, right? With characters around them and all this kind of stuff happening. The trick is we often don't have the budget slash skill slash raw ability to kind of always make that happen. And we don't always have that. Even if we do, you don't always have that ability to put it in every panel or every illustration because there's often time constraints, budgetary constraints for everyone because time is kind of money to a certain degree. So we always have to be creative in the way we do that. And I think it doesn't really matter where you are on that scale. Thinking about the focus is the thing that will allow you to make other decisions and maybe say, hey, Is there a different way that might not be as much of me showing off my drawing ability? Or maybe I couldn't draw that anyway, but is there another way of me doing that? How can I select from what I have to make sure that the thing I'm really focusing on, the feeling, the emotion, the story, that that thing still happens? One of the most interesting things I find talking to a lot of students over the years and mentoring people through these you know, sort of trials and tribulations is the degree to which as artists progress, it's not just their raw ability that progresses, it's their ability to imagine and conceive of ideas that work within a particular medium. Again, it might be film, it might be comics, it might be illustration, it might be concept art. They all behave a little bit differently. There are things that are really going to sing and really shine. If you have movement as an ability, then you can show movement, you can animate things. It should be about showing animation, showing movement. If you don't have a movement, you can't animate things, it's just two-dimensional. You need to think about the image 
as a two-dimensional image and what works for two-dimensional images. If you have a comic book, you need to think about how to tell a story using a number of panels and not necessarily just making every single one of them this masterwork. A lot of these things do involve much of the smoke and mirror ethos. A lot of success in comic books is about setting the scene. We spend a lot of budget, time, energy, maybe with an establishing shot. This tells us where we are. It shows us a bustling world. And then maybe later on, we don't show a lot of that background because people are going to assume that we are there. These are the tricks of particular mediums that allow us to get the focus and the idea across. And I think what you'll find is that in most cases, as artists get more advanced, they get better and better at imagining scenarios that work really well with a particular medium. And that often the challenges that people are having in the beginning are not just raw skill problems, but they're actually imagining ideas that no matter how much skill you had, no matter how much budget you had, that idea would never work because it's some fundamental violation of a medium. It's the idea for a moving image in a static medium, for instance. And again, it's just a matter of understanding that that is kind of how it works. You frequently have artists who are imagining images and have an ideas and they have focus and feelings that they're trying to create. And the reality is it's never going to work. The solution is to think creatively about how to express that same idea optimally through their chosen medium. If we look at two-dimensional art, again, this is a problem I see coming up frequently. People are imagining movies. They're imagining things moving around. People are fighting and multiple things are happening within a single image. With a single image, you only have one thing happening. If you want to show movement, if you want to show that things are happening, you have to be creative in the way you create your compositions. You're much more likely to be able to make the image look dynamic and visceral and like it's moving by thinking about not just how characters or things are actually posed, but by creating sort of dynamic two-dimensional movement within the frame, thinking about composition, lots of diagonals, lots of feelings of kind of flowing lines that transition across the image and make the viewer's eye actually move quickly throughout the frame. The image isn't moving, but the viewer will think it's moving because it's very dynamic from a two-dimensional standpoint. So at its core, artists get good at showing you their best hand, at utilizing a particular medium, at getting good at the smoke and mirrors. And fundamentally, I think that you should too, no matter what level of skill you're at currently. I think that we can actually improve our ability to do this. And the more we do, I think the better and more consistent overall our artwork will be. So on the one hand, our job as artists is yes, to build technique, craft, skill, ability. But our other task is to learn how to deploy it, how to take those skills and actually make sure that they are doing their best to communicate our feelings and emotions through our chosen medium. So hopefully I've made the case for this idea. What I want to do now is give you some takeaways, some actual things that we can sort of encapsulate this information in and make sure that we can apply this to our work day to day. If we look at this from an analytical standpoint, I think a good metaphor to use here is to understand that budget for something like a film is very much related somewhat to our ability as an artist. So if you think about these two things as being related, it's easy to see that if you just give someone lots and lots of budget, they're not going to be able to make a good film. It's often the directors and creators who have learned how to create great things with smaller budgets who are able to create even better things with larger budgets. I think Christopher Nolan is a good example of this. You can see that if you just take someone who doesn't maybe have that ability and that craft and they haven't learned to be creative, you can give them unlimited budgets and they're not going to produce a great film. You can see the number of, you know, sort of failed superhero or other big budget films where we have $300 million plus, we have unlimited money and the product is not necessarily better. This is because to create good art, I think you have to be very selective in what you do. And often budget actually makes that a lot trickier. There's a lot more ways to fail. 
And I think you can also look at artists who, you know, have maybe gotten good at creating art within a level of restriction, and then they've been given unlimited budget. No one's saying no to them. They can kind of do whatever they want, and the product doesn't necessarily get better. So you can think about that as being similar to your own ability. If you just sort of leveled up your ability to draw everything. It doesn't mean your story, your comic book, your gallery show, your art book is going to be any better because to make things uh, really high quality, it's very much going to be about the choices you make, the decisions you make, how you utilize your ability to actually sort of affect emotion through your chosen medium. You could probably go so far as to say that big budget is almost a problem. It's almost invariably going to end up with a poor product unless you have someone with discipline who is working within creative restraints. The real thing is that creativity really likes restraint. We work well when we have to be creative in this manner. And I think artists who get good at this ultimately are the only ones who can learn how to deploy a big budget in the end anyway. If you want a simple bro level way to state this, I think the key is to show your best work, put your best foot forward, show people the best things about what you can do. You could almost say, try and think about what would make your art better besides drawing. All right, if we look at some actual practical takeaways, like what could you actually go and do now? This is a bit of an amorphous concept. So I think thinking about this in terms of thought experiments is probably the best way to go. One way to think about this is to imagine that you as an individual artist are both the artist who is creating the work, but maybe if you think about your project being an art book, also think about yourself as an editor, as a book editor. You're working with this artist and you have to maybe direct them and tell them what are the best things they can do? How can you select from their work to produce a book that is going to be of the highest quality? If you are the artist, then you probably have your own set of aspirations. But again, if you're trying to get a certain level of quality, it really is a matter of thinking about how to draw from the work that you do have to create something that's going to have a certain level of polish and creativity. If you think very practically about the idea of an art book project as well, you can see that it might be good to consider other elements that might make the work look good as well. Things such as improving your graphic design, your typography. How do you actually present this? What are the things that are gonna make this feel really high quality? you probably find there's a lot of these things that are actually very basic. And if you focus on them and think about it this way, your natural artistic abilities will probably translate very well. But it's just a matter, again, of thinking of yourself as someone who's creating the entire project versus just the artist who is trying to showcase raw talent and ability. Along a similar line, just imagine that you are an art director and you're stuck working with this artist who is you. If you need to create a finished, polished work and you know that there's probably a lot of things you could get that artist to do that would be poor, how would you direct them, right? What would you say? How would you reduce the scope of the project? And what things can you really find in that artist's work that you think other people would enjoy looking at and that they're going to be able to have a fun time doing and that they want to do? and really just find the intersection of all those Venn diagrams, essentially, where you're gonna be able to have a good result. Again, the key here is just to separate the raw talent and you creating the work from choosing how it's presented. This is a real challenge for artists, however, and we often find it difficult to really know how people are viewing our art. The way that we view it and what we care about might be completely different to what someone else is thinking when they see it. Another good way to sort of frame this is to think about the general advice that is given to every single artist by every single art director or person who's hiring them to get a job. And that is don't show any of your bad work. It's recommended that you pick a very, very small selection of your work and you put a really good bit of that work first and a really good piece of that work last. You want to really wow someone and you want to leave on a really good note. And you want to make sure that there's nothing in there that is sort of low quality. Now, a lot of artists are sitting there going like, well, look, that makes sense. But I've got all these things and how about I show this and how about I do this and how about I do that? 
And the reality is none of that stuff works. It doesn't work because again, often what people who are hiring you are trying to figure out is what's your judgment like? What's your taste like? Do you understand how to create something that feels professional? If you put unprofessional, sloppy looking work in your folio, it brings up questions about your taste, about your choices. And often what someone needs to do is to be able to give you a project and know that you're going to make good choices. They're not going to constantly have to say, you're doing this work, this is good. And you're doing this work, that's bad. Why are you doing the bad work? Just do the good work, right? It's these very simple things where what you're actually being judged on as an artist is your taste, is your choices. Having average work in your folio makes people question whether you as an artist understand what your work is even about in the first place. Okay, lastly, if we look at this from a spiritual point of view, I think one thing that really sort of strikes me here is that often what we're actually trying to do is get rid of that ego, to try and separate us from the artist who is just trying to show and demonstrate ability and skill and move towards a situation where we are also engaging in the creative practice, where we're playing with what we display and we're making choices and we're getting better at that. I think this is fundamentally something that all good artists get good at doing naturally. There's a very Zen concept here where we are kind of giving up control in order to gain control. It's one of these counterintuitive processes, but I think that's very much part of the creative process in general. It's often about how we do with the happy accidents. We spot those things that are working well. Maybe we haven't even intended to do them, but nevertheless, they are ours. We have done it. It's our ability to spot that, to amplify the happy accidents, to you know, de-amplify the things that aren't working. Often we think an image that we're creating is going to work this way and then we find a different way. And part of getting good is letting go of the ego of like, but this is how I wanted it in the beginning and to just understand, yeah, but this is looking good. Let's do this. Now, this is very complicated because we often have to take into consideration briefs and all these other things. But I think fundamentally, an artist is subconsciously making these like these little decisions with every brushstroke. How do I make this better? Oh, that one didn't work. I tried to do this. It didn't work. Oh, this thing's working. This one's not. Let's go in this direction. There's like this sort of symphony of choices that are happening and they are happening subconsciously. There's a degree though to where we can utilize these same ideas at maybe a higher level of fidelity. Maybe not each brushstroke, but we're really trying to think about and use that same creative instinct that we develop as artists to make sure that we're putting our best foot forward in general when we're thinking about the components of a larger project. Obviously, we have this desire to get better on a craft, technique ability level. And I think that's very much a worthwhile pursuit. I think doing that will teach you many of the things that you need to do when it comes to developing this instinct. And I think that's really important. But what you need to think about is if you develop these skills of making good choices and selecting from what you have, developing your creativity, just think about what you'll be able to do with that skill once your technical skill increases as well. Ultimately, these things go hand in hand, and the more you develop them together, the better your final products are going to be. Hopefully this way, when you do get your big budget opportunity, when your skills do increase, when you have all of these things at your disposal, you really know what to do with them. You will have the restraint where you need it, the ability to make good creative choices, and the ability to channel all of your ability into the thing that actually matters, the true focus and heart of your story or creative endeavor. Just remember that to a certain degree, it's smoke and mirrors all the way down. Much of what we do is trying to make our audience think and feel things. None of this is really real. It's all about what you can get people to think. That is the key. And the more you understand that and the more you work on those skills, I think the better and happier you're going to be overall. All right, that's all we've got time for on this particular episode. I was actually motivated to make this one based on the previous episode where I suggested you start your masterwork. Just jump in and look, you know, deal with all the problems that come up. I think that that is a big challenge. And so I kind of wanted to offer this episode as potentially a way to think about how you might deal with a lot of those challenges. 
yes, your drawing might suck and yes, you're going to get better at it as you progress. Yes, I think projects are a great way to do that. Drawing a comic or whatever it is will help your technical skill improve. But what you also need to improve is your ability to make good choices, to implement your art and think about how to focus on your core idea and use your art to support your larger efforts. So hopefully this one has helped in that regard. Let me know if you've got any questions or comments. Let me know if the idea of thinking like a director resonates with you, whether this is going to help you going forward. I'd be really keen to know your thoughts. Leave me a comment, a like, subscribe on YouTube, um, or leave me a review on podcast platforms. And I'll catch you on the next one.